Good morning, folks. Good afternoon. Good evening. And the HackMD link is in their chat. Folks want to scribble your name. That takes nice. And Nia, you have the floor today, so I would probably just give a couple of minutes for folks to join. Sounds good. I folks want to just take a look at the hack, uh, the PR that Niaz has got up. Maybe that's a preparatory reading for the call. Uh, Marina, do you know if Tashank is joining today? Um, I think he had a conflicting meeting today. So I'll probably watch the recording. Yeah, and I didn't get the link up to the uh, videos, but I saw somebody else posted them. So who was that? So I can thank them specifically. Uh, Jan, where? Jan, no, Jan asked, and then Brandon found it. So thank you, Brandon. I will, I, I promise I will get to get the links to the specific meetings and post it to the uh, hack doc. In fact, there's our last one right there. Okay, um, should we go ahead and get started now? Go for it. Okay. Um, so we're continuing uh, looking at the requirements from last meeting. Um, we were in, uh, we were close to kind of uh, signing off on this uh, fourth requirement, which was a, a rotation of the root key should not require uh, the use of the existing root key. Um, I don't think we, I, I didn't see the notes from last meeting. Um, I, and so, uh, was there any other concerns, Marina, that we needed to address? I thought we would kind of closed on this one. Um, yeah, I think that there's still the concern about how to actually um, communicate that um, the new root key in a, in a secure manner. But um, I think that using that an out of band process um, should be all right for this. Um, okay. Yeah. 
what I'm going to add um, uh, is a section um, to this doc that calls out certain assumptions that we're making uh, in terms of what is happening out of band. Um, so for example, the sharing of the root key, this is something that we assume here, there is a, a secure mechanism that happens out of band uh, to make that work uh, for the initial uh, root, root sharing. So I'll add in a section for assumptions that uh, we're making are happening outside of the scope of this document. Yeah, I think that's a good idea because it's important people understand what happens out of band because uh, I think sometimes it's not explicit enough. But... Yeah, I'll, I'll add in a section for assumptions and uh, also guidance. Uh, there are certain things that we've called out as best practices for setting up like routes and signing keys. Uh, I think we can start kind of tracking those. So we have uh, a, a list of best practices as well available once we're done with this implementation. Okay, uh, <clears throat> moving on to the next requirement. Uh, publishers should be able to sign with keys stored in their local machines, secure tokens, HSMs, or cloud-based key management services. Um, I think this one um, coming out of uh, Notary V1, we realized that we would need to support um, developers having keys in a variety of different places. Um, is there any objection to this requirement? Okay, uh, it does, next one. It does, it does have some uh, implications about the kinds of keys we support just because of, so because those mechanisms don't always, often have restricted sets of kinds of keys they support. Um, it does kind of, I mean, it does in terms of best practice or usage, we, it means we have to be fairly um, lenient in the types of keys we allow. Are you basically saying that a registry would require a specific type of key, so doing offline? Well, no, well I mean, it's just, we, can't, we can't just say, oh, you have to use like ED25519 keys because to be honest, no cloud provider has a service that can sign with ED25519 keys and so it, we just it means we in general most clients are going to have to be able to understand a variety of key types um which is fine i think generally but it's just it's kind of um it's kind of frustrating how unstandardized and different the cloud provider apis for example happen to be for signing that's the focus of this meeting that we should come up with a standard. <laughs> well, it's not, it's not about it's just like you should come up with you should you should use more up to date. <laughs> No, I think that's part of one of the things that we want to uh, hash out as we get into implementation, right? Like, what is the crypto API standards that we want to support? Um, and that should come out and have requirements then for each one of the cloud providers to have an interface that works with uh, the Notary V2 client. Um, and so the details of the interface, I think we need a little bit more research to do, but once we agree on here's the approach, I think we have a common set of approaches we can look at uh, and, and have a more detailed uh, sort of discussion around key types and uh, API uh, support um, as we get into more of the detail. Yeah, like, yeah. Um, the next one that we had, go ahead. No, I think it should be fine, but. One point when I looked, there was one cloud provider who didn't support asymmetric key encryption in there, but I think that may have been fixed. By now. <laughs> the next uh, requirement we had was publishers should be able to generate multiple signatures for a single artifact. Uh, this one uh, has come up several times where we need um, uh, prior signatures to be preserved whenever an artifact is being resigned. So I think this brings up a requirement for having uh, multiple entities, uh, the ability to sign off on a single signature or essentially append a signature with their own. And I think just um, mostly technicality, I think that pairs with um, clients being able to kind of specify who should be signing. 
um, different different artifacts. Right. Um, this does introduce uh, a trade-off in that uh, signature size can essentially be um, unbounded um, or could have multiple, with multiple signatures, the signature size is growing. Um, are there any concerns uh, around that? So the way it's worded, I would do it a little differently because it, it sounds like a publisher can provide multiple keys, which they could, but it almost makes it too narrow. What we're really trying to do is an artifact can have multiple signatures. So the publisher might provide one or more. I'm not sure why they would provide more than one for the, as a publisher. I'm not saying there shouldn't be. But the idea is that a publisher can provide one. Docker Hub as you know a curator can uh, add one to it without changing anything. And then in our example, Acme Rockets can add one for their private environment so that only things signed by that, their key can be deployed. So it's, I would tweak the wording a little differently. Um, so the end result is broader. It, it just makes it a little narrower. And the, the second point is the size of the keys is an interesting one because what we're really, it's not that the key itself gets bigger because there's multiple si signatures. What we're saying is you have multiple signatures that can be assigned, but each one is independent. Um, so it means you can get multiples. I'm, there's nothing that says I couldn't get a hundred signatures for a particular artifact, but it's not one document. Um, so that kind of raises the question, well, great, if there's a bunch of signatures, how do I get the one that I care about? So one of the, th the things we're saying is we'd like to have a filter mechanism to give me back the keys that I care about. It wasn't signed by Docker. I don't care if it was signed by Wabbit Networks, but it wasn't signed by Docker and wasn't signed by Acme Rockets. So I don't, I guess my point is key size doesn't, signature size doesn't matter because uh, it's a collection um, and tweak the publishers. I mean, generally, so yeah. I'm not, I'm not bothered about signature size because it's very small compared to the object. So however many- Justin, it's hard to hear okay. you. Uh, sorry. Uh, signature size is, is very small compared to- um, <laughs> Anything else in a registry? Yeah. <laughs> the manifest is bigger than the signature size, I think. <laughs> yeah, so I'm really not, I don't, I'm not worried about that. But I think Niaz is making a point, with, if you support multiples, it could get bigger depending on the implementation. But because yeah, of the implementation, I mean, even each if, signature is unique. Yeah, but they're still not really that big. Oh, even if you got the entire collection, you're saying it wouldn't be a big yeah, deal. Yeah, it's, it's not. But, that's fair. It just yeah. people are paying the butt. You have to go get the yeah. more. But size isn't the issue here. Yeah, I agree on I agree on the wording change. Um, the size one is just something uh, just to call out to make sure that we don't have any bounds on it. Uh, and so if it's a collection, I think that's uh, easily avoidable. Okay. Uh, and and I'll, I'll reword all it. All collections will have paging APIs too. So I, I don't know if we want to put an arbitrary limit on the collection as long as we provide filtering. And like from a spec perspective, which is what you're kind of driving down on, I don't know if we need to clarify it anymore. Okay. Unless somebody else thinks differently. Uh, okay. Uh, the next requirement was uh, there should be a mechanism to revoke signatures to indicate they're no longer trusted. Um, this is one we've heard from a lot of different customers about, um, and I think uh, it's it's almost essential for a signing feature. Hundred percent agree. Is your screen frozen? I don't know how you would know that. The top of your screen says signing an artifact should not require. Is that where you're at? Oh, sorry. Uh, I can highlight it. Uh... Um, gotcha. I mean, what, what, I mean, this could be implemented in different ways, but I mean, so um, you want to re revoke signatures separately from the keys that sign them, do you? Is that the implication of this?
I think the implication here, uh, the implementation could be that you're revoking keys um, to say that here's a set of signatures that I no longer trust. Uh, being able to revoke individual signatures does get pretty challenging unless you have a pretty robust uh, key management in place. So uh, it's more around the ability to revoke a set of signatures, I think is what we're trying to get at here. I think you double back. It's revoke keys, which implication revoke signatures. Right. Okay. And I, I mean, again, it yeah. also worded as not publisher. Basically, anybody that any key that was used to sign can be revoked. So that's the publisher, Docker Hub, Acme Rockets. Well, so I think the key owner essentially should have a mechanism to revoke their keys. Um, and so I can I can change the wording on this to kind of clarify that a little bit. Well, we, we want all keys to be rotatable. Well, it's right. two, right? There's rotatable and revocable, or is yeah. the industry just assume that when a key is ro rotated, the old one's revoked? Is, well, that, is that how yeah, it works? Well, yeah, but I mean, the, the user should be able to rotate their key, the user of the key. If, if, if I think my key has been compromised, I want to rotate it. Uh, if we have a key hierarchy, the person who own who is above me in the hierarchy should be able to remove my key, like if I'm no longer an employee, and therefore. So I think there's a difference between key rotation and revocation, right? Like key rotation is something we expect to happen from a best practice to make sure that you have limited blast radius of things you're signing with your key. Uh, revocation is something that's saying that I no longer trust this key, so. From our perspective, just because a key has been rotated doesn't necessarily make the old key untrusted. Um, you wouldn't start untrusting the old key unless there's a very specific compromise that you're calling out, or the yeah, key, for example, has. Yeah. Right, can we just make this a bit more, maybe break this down a bit more? Because it's just. Ian had a note because his mic isn't working, so I'll, I'll voice his comments. Um, something about. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think. think yeah, about just, after date. Can, can we. I think we're missing a bunch of requirements here because we haven't got requirements about rotation as well as trying as I was trying to say. Other than I think that's a good call out. I can add in a mechanism for rotating keys. I think that's a that's a requirement that should come in as well. And also I would say that it's probably the keys that are revoked, not the signatures. Just yeah, that's what I was saying originally. Yeah. So I think it's just a bit unclear. No, I think that's fair. So I'm going to change this wording to go revoke keys and then add in another requirement for rotating keys. Uh, the next requirement that we had was uh, trust store should be configurable by the deployer. Uh, this is essentially calling out that you can go configure uh, the routes you want to trust in your deployment environment. I would say it's a, um, um, it's definitely true that you want it to be configurable by the um, deployer, but I would say that the trust store is, it, it, I feel like it's a bit of an implementation with details in the requirements, um, exactly how that works, if that makes sense. I'll play this, the one that doesn't know the details here enough to understand. It, do we have what trust store is written down somewhere? Because I don't know what you mean, the registry, the client, Oh, that section right there you just scrolled past? Okay. okay. Yeah. So a truster essentially we're calling out as a relationship between uh, the signing keys and the validation being done. Um, so the truster is essentially going to relate a source, whether it's a specific registry, repository, or specific target, or any source uh, with a uh, certificate that has like a root key, uh, either intermediate or signing key. Um, and so that's really the relationship we're establishing there. And so um, what we're calling out here is that there should be some control for uh, uh, developers to essentially go in and say, here are the routes that I want to trust. Uh, and that's a control that should be exposed. OK, I think I understand now. So I'm a little confused as whether this is in the registry on the client or both still. Like a, in a, maybe an example call out. 
Okay. This should be in the client. So this one as well. I can add some more context and, and, and narrow this requirement down. So essentially what I think we're, uh, what this requirement is, uh, can be rewarded as like developers should have the ability to configure routes that they trust in their deployment environments. That makes it super clear. Um, I, I, and maybe that's enough. That's why I'm asking others. I, I'm wondering if the definition needs to be tweaked a little bit because maybe the, what you're teasing out as an interesting one is certainly on a client, I want to make a determination that regardless of what keys may or may not be on an artifact, it must have this one, two, or three. And if it doesn't have one, two, or, or and all three, I won't deploy it. There's another one, maybe, I'm asking, is in a registry, should there be some enforcement of what keys and routes are allowed to be pushed to a registry? Do I get to push the bad guy key to a registry if I know if the registry knows there's the bad guy key that it doesn't want to accept? Is that a real scenario? I think that should be an optional requirement um, because uh, it, it I, I want to leave that choice up to the registry operator to say, here's how we're going to curate signatures and here's what validation and presentation we're going to do. Um, but there's nothing that prevents them from using uh, whatever we're using in the deployment environments to do a similar um, a validation themselves. Uh, the next one that I had was deployers must be able to configure trusted in entities for individual repositories and target. Um, I think this one gets rewarded to say for individual registries, repositories and targets just to make sure we cover um, all three granularities. But um, this is essentially saying that um, rather than saying here's a key that I trust for everything, uh, we're allowing the capability of saying which specific registry repository or target do I trust this key for? What's the use case for configuration per target? That seems really weird thing to do. I think it kind of boils down to how do artifacts get managed? Um, do we always expect like a, a uniform management where let's say large enterprises are going to have let's say individual repositories per different applications that they publish or do they end up as same targets in the same in, in, in a single repository and then you're saying I uh, trust this key for this team versus this entire like organization? Normally, um, I mean, normally the normally the permission boundary is the and the registry is the repository. So normally, the same people have right access for everything in the repository, and we don't have separate permissions per target. So it does. Um, I mean, effectively, if you have set it for one target, then it's simply one item and you might as well just use the hash of it and not check the signatures. It just seems, it seems very strange to me. The hash would essentially tell you that the uh, whatever you're getting from the registry is uh, has not been tampered with, but doesn't necessarily tell you um, whether coming from the publisher it has been tampered with or not, right? Uh, and I think this kind of went more into like, do we expect a scenario where uh, multiple teams would end up with different targets in the same repository um, and would you want to scope that trust down to like a, a single uh, team or single sort of like group within an organization right um, and so this one i think you know if we don't have a use case for that that's pretty simple to kind of say registries or repositories but um, it 
I don't think I mean, it changed. Go ahead. With a, but you wouldn't, if a target would be one, uh, you'd have to know which items were going to be pushed up front to know which team they belong to, which would be, it's just, I, I can't see any circumstances in which that would, would really work. And I, I'm I sure. you have to have a list of items and, uh, and know in advance what all the items were going to be. I think you're touching a little bit on the permission boundaries and stuff. Whereas, you know, individual registries, you know, Coke and Pepsi in the same cloud are going to have different registries or different storage buckets, whatever we want to call them. Um, so they have complete autonomy amongst themselves. In a single registry, as a number of us support multiple teams in the same registry with sub permission boundaries, team A should not have any access to team B's content, even in the same registry. Is, is that the same, In the same repository, like in the same namespace. In the same namespace, I don't think any of us are doing unique permission boundaries. Yeah, that's why this, that, that's, that, that's why the target thing doesn't make any sense to me. Is that it, yeah, and that's why I think I'm curious that we're just getting tied up into some of the the uh, update framework um, terminology of targets. Well, what, so in that case, what do you mean by targets? Yes. That's what I'm asking. I'm not sure. Now, I kind of went down to sort of like what is the most granular level that you can specify uh, trust for, and that would be down at the individual artifact level. Um, like uh, from a signature validation perspective, it doesn't really matter much because you're essentially just looking at different chunks of like, you know, where this artifact came from, right? So we can, uh, like this, I, I don't think this changes the uh, trust or accept that. Um, if you have people kind of like, you know, scoping down individual targets, that's a lot of like work they're putting in and the truster can essentially just grow in size. Um, but it, it doesn't, I think, break down the implementation that we would have and how do we go validate these signatures. So um, if this is a control that we feel like is going too far, um, I think that's uh, fairly easy to kind of just say, we're gonna allow you to scope it down to uh, repositories, I mean, but yeah. You, you've put must, and I mean, I don't think, I'm, I, would, I wouldn't implement it, so I would not be in spec, I guess is what I'm saying. It seems, it's, I, I think taking out the must for targets is fine, would be fine if you... So you're saying targets, Justin, just so I understand the terminology, target is the specific artifact in the same repo. So artifact yeah. one and artifact two are separate targets? So it's, it's Ubuntu 16.10.1, and you have a special rule for Ubuntu 16.10.1 that is different from your rule for Ubuntu 16.10.2. Okay, so the way we think different tags in the same re repo should not, we don't believe today, and I think this is, so maybe it's at repository instead of targets. And, and this might be just terminology around registries compared to other package managers. As of today, I don't know of any registry that does unique permissions within a repository. So to Justin's point, whether it be a version tag of the same Ubuntu image or even an architecture tag in the same, basically because the tag is just a string. There should be no, we're not saying we want to support permissions at that granular level, because none of, I don't know any of us that are doing it. None of us would want to take on that extra burden. Um, but at a repo, makes total sense. So, I, and this would give me some amount of that rollback protection, I assume, because the 1604 versus the 1601, um, having some kind of rollback protection around that makes, makes sense in the permission boundaries that we support today. Coke and Pepsi can't play in the same repo. So it's it's a non and neither can team A and team B. So I think part of this is also kind of making sure that you have roll forward protections, right? So let's say you have Ubuntu 16.1 and 16.2 comes out. Um, your administrator may not want you to go to 16.2 until they have been able to validate it. Right, uh, and they may still want you to kind of verify with the original Ubuntu signature. So in that scenario, there may be a case where they actually want to go in and update the target to say, okay, now we trust 16.2 with this signature and have that level of control. So you're not able to necessarily pull in any version of Ubuntu that you want. 
So I think there's different mechanisms to do that. The reason I have it here right now is that uh, whether you're validating a registry repository or target, um, in, in, in terms of the implementation, um, it doesn't really change much because you're really looking at what is the artifact I'm getting and what is the uh, what what is what's specified in my trust store for this artifact itself, and you're matching to see uh, which part of the registry repository or the target um, you're you're matching from the entire string, right? So, to me, the this putting in this functionality doesn't really change the implementation, um, but I think it is a good call out to say that. The must of it should be registry and repository because we don't have a strong case for target, uh, but we can get the target out of like the same implementation. So targets is optional, but you'll get it as a result of the implementation. I mean, I like your scenario that I have to validate an old to go to the new. I have to think about it more, but the, the conceptually it makes perfect sense that, but because, well, the beauty is because we allow signatures to move within a registry across repos and across registries, then there's a promotion process that can be done out of band. So I would have my staging registry or even my staging repo that could have multiples, but my prod or whatever I consider the critical workload that I don't want to do this uh, roll forward thing until I'm comfortable um, is a way that I would probably suggest people doing it. Because now I don't have to worry about permission boundaries or even the configuration boundaries inside of a, a repo. Um, so I think that threads the needle of what Justin and I are kind of covering on the boundaries of what we want to do in a repo versus a registry. So I think, and, and again, I'm- I think this I'm requirement pushing. gets- Go ahead. Sorry. I think this requirement gets rewarded to say for individual registries and repositories because that's where the need is. If we get targets out of that same requirement, then that's a bonus. Uh, I think that's optional, right? I don't think we should. I, I agree with that. There's probably not a strong requirement to kind of say, hey, if we don't, if we can't support target, this is a no go. But if we get it, then that's that's great to have. I would, unless somebody else says differently, I'm looking who else is here to represent a registry. I, I would actually not even include targets in that and just say re registries and repos. Justin, what do you think? I mean, okay. if we omit it from the mast, then that's fine. I'm happy with that. Then because, like, if if someone makes a implementation that supports it, I guess I don't care. <laughs> um, I, I'm not going to make one, but. Someone yeah, I, I think nothing, just because it's not in the spec doesn't mean somebody couldn't do something. Uh, I think CodeFresh does something at, at tag level, but I, I, I wouldn't want to put it in the spec of even a, a should or could or would. I, there's nothing stops people from going further, but I, I really want to be careful about trying to put any suggestion that you can do permissions or anything unique inside of a repo. Now, I could have Ubuntu one was signed with one key and Ubuntu two signed with a different key for because it's a really critical difference. And then I could have a, a configuration that says I don't trust uh, key one. I only trust the one that goes to key two. So that that's one way if you really, really needed to do something in a repo, you could, but it, I think we've beaten this one to death. I think at the point is we're trying, I'm trying suggesting any permissions inside of a repo. Yeah, I think let's let's move on. I think I'll, I'm, I'm okay switching the language there and uh, calling that out. Okay. Uh, the next one was uh, developers must deployers must be able to validate signatures on any version of an artifact, including whether they've been revoked by the publisher. Um, uh, this one, I think, just kind of going into like you know being able to uh, validate older targets and and make sure whether they've been revoked or not. What is, uh, I'm confused on a little bit on the signatures or any version. Your, the revocation is at the key level. What is the version aspect that can be revoked? Basically, you have to be able to go back in time and see, would you have validated this last Thursday or something for audit purposes or, um, um, or I just want to, I want to, my, my machine, uh, um, you know that kind of that kind of question that you have to be able to answer. I think if it's mine, if I understand that correctly. 
Yeah, and then part of it also is that, like, you know, when we go back to that earlier example of Ubuntu 10.1.2 versus 10.1.3, uh, even when 10.1.3 is the latest, if my uh, security team hasn't validated it, I should still be able to use 10.1.2 or even 10.1.1 if I'm two versions behind. Uh, and I should be able to validate whether those signatures have been revoked or not, independent of the fact that 10.1.3 is the latest version that's out there. But you're using the term signature got revoked as opposed to the key got revoked. So I don't know how you revoke a signature. Uh, yeah. I think I, I need to reword this to clarify whether the keys that have been used for that have been revoked or not. And then this goes back into the best practice where we would say that for each new major version, you're rotating your keys uh, before you sign it. So you have a smaller blast radius in the, revoca in, in the scenario of a key compromise. Is that a best practice? To minute, is it, sorry. Is it a new major version? Are you rotating or rotating and revoking? You are just rotating. You're not rotating yeah. and revoking. Yeah. In that case, the wording is very confusing. I thought you actually wanted to test things that had been revoked, but that was why I came up with the example of testing what you would have seen last Thursday, which is a different use case. So I'll clarify this one to say that um, you should be able to validate signatures on any version, including whether the keys have been revoked by the publisher. Okay, let's take another iteration on that one. Okay, I think and then the last- Your clarity when you, when you give another scrum. Sure. And the last one I had was uh, signature validation must be enforceable in an air gapped environment with minimal updates. Um, this goes into making sure that we don't need air gapped operators to do uh, constant changes in their environment. Um, they're able to either pull in things like CRLs or update their trust stores and be able to manage them uh, uh, within an environment. Um, we can, we'll, we'll come back and address what the minimal means in, uh, in the more detailed implementation. Uh, I think a lot of it really depends on, uh, how quickly we expect, uh, trust configurations to change, uh, which we want to minimize to, uh, the, uh, security events essentially, like whenever something bad happens is when you'd want to go in and update that trust store. I think this is one we're going to have to elaborate a bit more because just to repeat the same thing, the air gap is not nuclear submarines and oil platforms just, or it is not just those. It is in clouds, customers want all public access disabled. So it's literally a private network, which there's millions of them inside each cloud. So if there's millions of them, we can't have millions of additional things, complex configuration set up. It should be super simple to set this up, I think is your, your main point here. But if, in those cases, uh, you would presumably, they're not, to, they're not totally offline. They're not in a submarine. So they can actually update when keys, when, when new key configuration, you know, when there's new keys and things like that. Well, the dirty oh, no. secret is air gaps aren't completely offline. There's just, there's a gap between it, whether it be a diode or others, there's there's always some way to get content in. It's just, it's extremely controlled. I think it's what, what this is trying to call out is that if you have a controlled update where let's say, um, um, I, I know that there has been like a root revocation or I know that one of the keys has been revoked. That's only really when I need to go in and take an action. Uh, besides that, I'm not necessarily having to go in and touch my trust stores, right? Uh, and so that's really what it come, boils down to is that, um, yes, there, there will be some work for air gapped environments to update their uh, update their configurations, but the work there should be minimized to uh, when they need to. And I think this is where minimal is kind of like a goal here rather than it is a requirement. Uh, once we get into the implementation itself, I think if we have trade-offs where we need to discuss, like, you know, what would this mean for an air-gapped environment? Uh, I think this, is, this, this, this would help kind of clarify some of the decision-making there. I think maybe if it's, if it's not quite 100% clear, maybe not making a requirement, but some kind of like, you know, suggestion or something just to make sure that's clear, that'd be helpful. 
Yes, the requirements, everything else is really good for requirements. This one's a little nebulous on the how, so it's almost like there's a goal because what I, one implementation or one more specific could, thing could be is I don't have to go back to the root authority for the key to know it was revoked. There's a delegation model that says in my air gapped environment, this URL is a proxy for everything else. And I trust that proxy, so that's okay. Uh, so it's, I get what you're trying to say, like air gapped is a requirement that we, we, that is a requirement for our success. This is the one that has a little more nebulous to it that I don't know if we can get more clear. And again, I turn to the key experts on what is the standard practice for how to put that in a requirement. Um, I can change this to an optional one just to kind of make sure that we track it as a goal. Uh, I don't want to lose sight of this one as we kind of go through uh, some of the more implementation designs, right? I think uh, minimizing the work for aircraft environments is something that we should strive to do. So um, I can change this to make this a little bit more of an optional goal. But no, I don't um, think it's an optional goal. I, I think it is a must goal. I, the problem is, is that the must Minimal updates, I, I don't know, I think people are struggling on the word minimal updates as opposed to we must support air gapped environments. And maybe you can just say we must support air gap environments and don't and just drop off the minimal updates part and then when, if we get more clear later on. I think the minimal updates is the kick me. Um, I'll, I'll look into this one a little bit more and see if there's a uh, clearer language. I think there is a different requirement though that we want to talk about. I just saw Trishang's note come in. Uh, which was the fourth requirement, uh, which is rotation of the root key should not require the use of the existing root key. Yeah, hi. Uh, so as we discussed last week, uh, yeah, my objection here is that it, well, maybe it's meant to be optional, but it seems to strongly discourage users who want to do this anyway um, from being able to support this use case. That's my concern. So I think the the reason we take a strong stance on that is that from the perspective of the deployer, there's no way to know whether this rotation is a transparent rotation or it is a malicious rotation, right? Uh, and this is where we think going back to how your out of band mechanism that you have to establish the route is where we want to push people towards. And those routes, you know, should be long-lived, um, um, should be used frequent, infrequently, and we should really push more towards like being using intermediates that you're rotating. This, uh, that I think gives us the best security posture. But if you're if you're able to rotate your routes transparently, uh, it means a malicious attacker could also potentially rotate your routes transparently. I think this is where the difference between rotation and revocation really comes in. Because I think that if you're revoking the root, I think you definitely need to do that not using the existing key that is compromised, or at least have a mechanism to overwrite an attacker rotated key. But in the usual case, when there's not an attack, I think this um, is actually more secure because um, it uses something that's already trusted instead of an out of band mechanism, which could also be compromised, kind of adding to the attack surface of but the deployer doesn't can't differentiate between the two is what I'm getting at, right? Like as a deployer, I don't know if you have updated your route because it was a normal operation or you've updated it. Someone, a malicious attacker has updated it, right? Like I can't distinguish that. Yeah, but you if, also if can't it, distinguish if an attacker is just uploading metadata. Yeah, exactly. yeah I mean, what, what, if a malicious attacker owns the root key, you're, you can't trust anything at that point. So only doing an out of band re replacement is the only thing you can do at that point. Well, not for uncompromised users, right? So I think it's a double edge. I think what I think I understand where Nias is coming from here, and I think it's a valid concern. I think you you end up with with do it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. And here's what I mean, because. Let's say the root key is compromised and, and Justin's absolutely right here. You can do a lot more damage than just 
uh, updating it to malicious root keys you control next, right? You could, you could do a lot of damage. You could install malware and use these machines. So being able to prevent them and, and say, hey, look, you're not going to be able to use the old root keys to, to make it sign for new one. Great. Now, here's the problem. What about, let's say that scenario happens, and then now you have all these other users who have not fallen for this attack. Now, how do they update? Now, their binaries are broken until everyone updates, which is also potentially destructive. Does that make sense? I'm not quite sure I followed um, in the sense that if the if the root is compromised, you essentially need to configure a new root, right? Um, and that's a painful process, like totally agree with that. But the how you know which one is the new root to trust, right? Um, you would need some kind of a mechanism to say, here's what we do trust, right? Uh, and I think this boils down to when we think about configuring um, trust, I'm not necessarily saying I trust this key because I got it from a hub. I'm saying I trust this key because I, I, I can verify the publisher uh, and I know that this is the, the key that they're providing because of X, Y, and Z reason, right? Um, either that's because like, you know, for large enterprises, you may be able to go to their website and say, I, you know, I, this is like, you know, uh, Microsoft.com or Amazon.com or Docker.io. And like, I know that this, this website's validated. So I trust the keys that are hosted here. Um, it could also be something along the lines of like, you know, I trust CAs because they're publishing audit reports and through their audits, I know like these are the routes that I can trust. But you have some mechanism that's not necessarily automated that tells you that this is the source of this key and this is why I trust it, right? Um, and chaining up the, the, the chaining up to sort of like a root, I think kind of like, yes, it does allow you to expedite kind of getting a, a key in place. Um, but you're only just really trusting the previous key to say that. And that key cannot necessarily always be trusted in the same, um, to the same uh, degree that you would trust an out-of-band mechanism is what I'm getting at. Well, I mean, I think that you're putting a lot of faith in this out-of-band mechanism in this case, because um, there's nothing to be said to say that the out-of-band mechanism can't also have, you know, can also be compromised. And I think that's part of the challenge here is how much you rely on the third party not really specified mechanism and how much to try and rely on the mechanism, the internal mechanisms, which we know how much or how little we can trust. Well, this is kind of, I think, pushing towards a two-factor authentication, right? In that sense that if a root were compromised, uh, you're expecting that their communication method hasn't been compromised. And if their communication method's been compromised, if their root isn't compromised, like you're not, you're, it's not really, there's really not an issue there. You need both to be compromised. Sorry. Um, but if, so if, you, if you manage to compromise the out-of-band mechanism and you replace the existing root key claiming that it's been compromised, you now have control of the registry. You don't because it's not an automated mechanism is what I was getting at, right? Like if, if I see that um, someone has, has, has rotated the key, I still have like, you know, I still, I still have a mechanism of validating that it's not an automated process that's necessarily pushing in a new key into my deployment environment. Like there is still a manual action that I need to take. And when I see that key changing, like I have an opportunity to go ask, hey, what, why was this key changed, right? Yeah, I, I think I see what you're saying. That's a valid concern. So I think rather than trying to prevent this outright, what I would rather see, because I still think there's a valid use case where you do want to use the previous root key to transparently, in case things haven't gone wrong, for example, like Marina pointed out, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to do this. So I think what might be a better solution is if we say something like by default, um, you Tao shall not trust the previous root key to hand over the uh, hand over, hand you over a new root key. I think that's a good safe default. That's that, fine. That would well, be able to override this default if you wanted to. Sorry, go ahead. But there's also it's actually confusing about what the wording is trying to rule out. So, yeah, so you're trying to say it should be possible for there to be a rotation without the use of the existing root key, or are you trying to say? Uh, you must not trust a rotation that does use the existing root key because those are kind of different things. 
I think it's the it's the first where the rotation should not require the current root key. Okay, right? but so so you're not ruling out in band key rotation. Um, I actually think I should. Um, that's say not clear I, from. Yeah, say I want I, to I, rotate my key from RSA two thousand forty eight bits to RSA four thousand ninety six bits because it's more secure now. I hit you know kind of thing or something like that or some other, you know, I want to rotate from one cipher to another because um, it's got better support in my HSM or something like that. Why should I not be able to do that in band? That seems a perfectly reasonable thing to want to do. The in band part comes in because uh, you can't differentiate whether the in band is trusted or not, right? Like from a, from a we have to think from the deployment and the signers being sort of like different entities, right? And if you don't have a communication or something else that says that, hey, go trust this, then you don't really know, right? That, that, that's what I'm getting at. Uh, any, any mechanism where you have in-band rotation is vulnerable to, a, uh, to an attacker compromising the key and then rotating the key for you. Sure, it can have other impacts, but the, the in-band rotation kind of, I think, adds to the pain of being able to kind of get back to where you need to be. Because uh, now you have to go back and manually redo your cluster anyway. So I'm not sure what the in-band rotation offers. I think the, the, the two things that I would kind of throw out there is that we also want the the root keys not to be rotated that often unless there is like a, a security requirement uh, or something else that comes up, which there are, but they're not like, you know, you're not having to do this on a yearly basis. Yeah, that's fine, but uh, you shouldn't prevent people who want to do this. So that's why I recommend, um, you can turn this off by default. You can say, you know, we strongly recommend that you don't do this, that you don't trust in bad root rotations. It is turned off by default, but if you wanted to, here's an escape hatch. Just flip this Boolean, for example. I think that's much more reasonable. But what about the, the security scenario though, right? Like I think that is introducing a security flaw in our mind. Like it doesn't protect you um, from an attacker rotating your key. But this is true for, I mean, presumably you would need a way to rotate other keys, not just root key. And, and That's where you're in the same flaw. Well, so you have your chain of, you have your chain uh, of trust coming in, right? Like, and if an intermediate is compromised, you know, or if like a signing key is compromised because like, let's say a developer had access to it, um, you, because you have your, your root protected and your intermediate protected, uh, you can actually go out and say, I'm going to revoke this key and I'm going to rotate and, and issue a new signing key and, and sign with those, right? So from the, 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 per, from the perspective of like, you know, which key, different keys should have different exposure, the keys that have the most exposure have rotation built in. It's really just the root that we're saying should not have auto rotation built in. But, Everything but if, else, go ahead. But, but if you're, if the attacker has compromised the root key, they can rotate all the other intermediates to their keys, which has basically the same effect as rotating the root. That's true, yeah. Can what do you key management experts parse what Ian is uh, suggesting also here for adding? Yeah, I think that that's a really good idea because it does mitigate the impact of any of these compromises we discuss if you have two different roots. Um, then it, it, as long as they're stored in very, very different locations and different methods or whatever, so that they're not both compromised at the same time. Um, I think that's part of the idea of having multiple signatures on root, in fact, is that you can have different keys stored in different ways that theoretically couldn't be compromised at the same time. I think in practice, we're going to see very different things. That's what concerns me there. Um, like, yes, we can expect like, you know, uh, people that have like, uh, or developers that have a lot of resources to potentially go set something up. Uh, but, you know, are we really going to see uh, multiple routes across multiple regions or, or, or in, you know, distinct HSMs for individual developers? I think that's where my concern is. And I think like the way I look at it, let's say, for example, if uh, 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 Docker had a root, right? Uh, and if you have intermediates going out to like different developers that are using it, then 
potentially those intermediates can be rotated, but really Docker saying that, hey, I need to rotate my root is a very different distinction than sort of like a, a publisher having to rotate their root. So it really boils down to like how much trust we're placing in this root. Um, and that's where I think like I'm very uncomfortable saying that uh, a, an automated mechanism to rotate it uh, uh, would would be something that we'd be okay with. Well, I think this goes back to um, how much is covered by the root. Because if, if every developer has their own root, then yes, I agree that maybe it'd be harder to store. But if the root is like higher up in the chain, um, in like the registry level, I think you can require or expect a little bit better key management um, from that group. And I think that's kind of what we were going towards, right? Like for individual developers, uh, we don't necessarily expect them to set up the PKI as much as they need a mechanism for key distribution, which I think could have like a curated root, right? Uh, where you're signing up for some sort of an identity, you're getting an intermediate, uh, but the root is not something that potentially you are, uh, uh, you would be touching or, or have exposure to. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I think we all have the same ideas in mind. I'm just concerned about um, ruling out, you know, use cases like Justin mentioned, where, for example, you want to update from smaller size keys to bigger size keys because, you know, suddenly the security requirements have changed. And I'm not sure that's a great idea. I think I'm kind of also looking at how uh, TLS certs have also been managed. Um, and I think, you know, uh, like I said, like a, a root update is painful process regardless of how you do it. Um, and we've seen that work. Like that model is something that we know, like, you know, uh, root rotations will take, will, will take years to plan for. Um, and you need to make sure that the update gets out. So it's not it's not a streamlined process where you can just go flip a switch and like the root gets updated. I totally agree with that. But I think the trade-off there from what we've seen, um, it has it has worked, right? Um, and this automated root rotation is something that we have gotten a strong pushback from in terms of like it, it goes counter to the security models that we have in place today. Well, in practice, uh, current if, if you look at TLS, the way root it's done through your operating system or, or sometimes the application itself. So, so there is work done somewhere and you don't get it for free. You have to update the application or your operating system. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is a larger issue that I'm afraid we're running out of time and I don't keep, um, yeah. Um, but we should discuss this offline. So I'm, I'm not sure that we should make this a requirement. Um, what do people want to? Shall we um, revisit this? Shall we? Do people want to spend more time thinking about it and come back with some further discussion, or what? what um, or what do we want to do here? I mean, we did I say we wanted to get something committed. So maybe Niaz, if you want to tweak the ones where I think it's just a tweak, if we agree in concept and propose that and then do a separate issue or a separate PR on this one to iterate? Does that sound like a way to divide and conquer on this one? Yeah, I can pull, uh, I can mark this one with an asterisk and say like, you know, we were still working on this one and um, have the rest kind of like revised. I think that works. And Trishank, I'll set some time up with you uh, to kind of like we can chat more in depth uh, and see if we can uh, find a middle ground here. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. And anyone else interested, please join us too. All right, well, thanks, folks. Um, just a point of order for scheduling. So we have next week, and then the following week is the Thanksgiving week, and a lot of people just turn into turkeys, so that week will be kind of shot. Um, so my proposal, we won't have any week, any meeting the week of the 23rd. Um, so anything we want to cover next week, and then we'll resume back on the 30th. So just a point there. Sorry, what date? When's KubeCon? Is that the next week? I don't know. 
I think it is. <laughs> we did a recording, so I don't know. Yeah, I think it is. So, so it's the whole week. And, okay, so you want to? You're saying basically, well, let's take a quick look, and then we'll just. Decide. I think um, yeah, Cloud Native Security Day is on Monday. I think. Um, November seventeenth to twentieth. So technically. Oh, because you're saying it's the cloud, it's the pre-con is the 16th. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're proposing cancel next week as well. Yeah. But if we can try and follow up on Slack, as it's a bit of a gap. Yeah, obviously everybody keep up on Slack conversations. So um, I've got a couple of other things that I've been uh, focusing on um, this week and planning. So, uh, I probably won't have many updates from the distribution side and the notary client in the next two weeks, but um, any kind yeah, why don't we just do that? Let's, let's put a focus on the KubeCon for next week. So unless somebody has something specific to talk about, we could talk about it on Slack. So let's cancel next Mondays and the 23rd and we'll resume on the 30th. So with that, We'll let people get on with their day or evening. Thanks, folks. And I'll get uh, the HackMD doc updated with the uh, recordings. See you later. Yeah, thanks. Okay.